Welcome to today's 3D print. Today we're going to talk about stacking. How I created the stack. You're printing PPE, you're printing face shields for your local hospitals and whatnot. And well, the problem is printing them one at a time is extremely inefficient. Um, I can actually do them slightly faster per piece if I print them one at a time, but I then have to go to the machine over and over and over again to remove the prints, restart the printer, etc. So the question is, well, can I make my 3D printer into a factory? Can I create the stack? <laughs> Stay tuned as we go over what it takes to do this and the trials and tribulations of making this work. So this is something I call the stack. It's basically vertical sequential printing. You probably saw a similar video from Devin Montez over at Make Anything. He's doing something similar. Well, I took a more technical approach to it to see you know, what is actually involved in making stacks and how do you prevent you know, beautiful, glorious, fused stacks like this that are never coming apart ever again. This is so beautiful, I'm keeping it. <laughs> you can see I tried to take one off there and yeah, that did not work. And it's a lot of work. I have a lot of fails. This is a fraction of my fails. Um, this is all bad. This is my initial um, bad ones, which I will be going over with you in detail in a moment. <clears throat> but how did I get from this to something that works? Well, you want these and you want to print them vertically, but you need to be able to get them apart. And let me show you how um, easily these can come apart if you get it tuned right and there's a little bit of art a little bit of trial and error a little bit of science involved but um, basically when you take one of my stacks you should be able to take them apart by hand something that can help is to take your stack like this and give it a twist they're all that cracking that's these layers all separating that's what you want right give those layers a nice solid cracking help facilitate separating them and then you should be able to start pulling these apart by hand. There we go. If you have to use tools, you could probably tweak your printer settings to remove the need to use tools to pull them apart. You do have to be careful with the ears. The ears love to um, bend because they're a soft, malleable part of the print. But you should, that's where you just take your finger and you put it in here and you pop the ears off. These are what I call the ears. And, um, but yeah, you should be able to pull them apart by hand and you should have nice, clean prints when you're done that don't require any cleanup or work. Well, sometimes they don't separate this easily. And I'm at like, I'm at revision four, but each of those revisions has like 10 different variations. And I've probably got like, 30 different micro revisions working on getting to this point where I can pull them apart like this. It comes down to temperature, air gap, geometry, extrusion speed, extrusion width, and um, yeah, it's a, and then there's some printers where it's just, they're a pain in the butt. <laughs> where no matter what you do, it's just hard to get them apart. Um, in a, if you have trouble getting one apart, this actually I can pull apart, but I'm just going to show you. You can use something like a screwdriver. Put it right in here in the corner right here and just give it a little a pry up. You want to try to be careful not to um, try pushing through parts because if you have to push through the part, I, I guarantee you, you're going to end up with cuts and sores all over your hands because you're going to stab yourself multiple times. I think I've stabbed myself, you know, half a dozen times getting these damn prints apart. So that's why my objective is to get to the point where I can just pull them apart by hand without having to use any tools to take them apart. As you see, I'm making a lot of them. <laughs> and this is batch number two. I've already mailed off batch number one of about 170 of these. Matter of fact, my biggest limitation is paying for shipping. I have plenty of filament. I have 700 rolls of filament. I, I, I do not need filament. I do not need printers. I need um, more electricity and um, um, shipping. <laughs> That's where my limitation is. But I'll do what I can. So how did it start? I started off printing these, and they were coming out messy. <laughs> my my bottom layers were being destroyed, and then you can see I have parts where 
it's not grabbing properly, where the shape is not grabbing properly here. And we're going to go over why that happens, how to get around it, and how to fix it. Okay. And the consequence is these solutions allow you to increase your air gap more than you think you can, which allows you to do hand separation of parts like that. Uh, so we're going to go over how I did that. The first things first, geometry. Right? In order to stack, you have to be able to mate two parts together. So that means these two surfaces that touch each other, they, they can't be asymmetrical. You, you can't print a, a bigger part on top of a smaller part. It's just not going to work. If you were to try to print you know, this on top of this, it's not going to work because these parts are going to overhang. You can't air print. But you can print smaller on top of bigger. That's no problem. And actually, that's part of where I ran the problem with this. The way this model is designed, this is the... Verkstan, 3D Verkstan um, visor. This is the one that TH3D is using. So this just goes on your head. It, it gains stiffness once you add the visor to it. So the plastic would sit on here and that would give you your stiffness once you add the plastic. I also have a gigantic head. <laughs> that doesn't help. Um, but once you put the visor on there, that works a lot better. So, the core problem I've run into is um, this part was designed has a bevel on the bottom, which is actually a good thing because that means smaller on top of bigger, and because the top surface is bigger than the bottom surface, and you have bottom layers. Well, the bottom layers was the problem because what happens is when you have a part where the perimeter doesn't correctly attach, like it does here, when you have a problem where that perimeter doesn't attach, like you see there. Well, then when it tries to do the infill to fill in the solid layer, there's nothing to attach to. Because here's your perimeter, and here's your solid infill, and you have an overlap. Okay? But if your perimeter is out here because it didn't print correctly, well, it's still going to try to put your infill here, and there's nothing to attach to. And that's why you get this. Okay? That was actually pretty easy to solve. Flip the part over. You know, make the solid layers the top layers instead of the bottom layers this way as it builds up a rigid base of the part those perimeters even if they're not quite attached right they'll eventually attach right you can see here it started off not attaching correctly you see here it's hard to everything's mirrored in the freaking video and it's really annoying um you can see here it didn't attach here but eventually the model corrected itself so these layers here are fine so make that the bridging so I basically flipped the model over. I bridged on top instead of bridging on the bottom. This way, if the bottom doesn't quite attach right, as long as it corrects itself by the time it gets to the top, you're fine. Now you're doing top layers, and you have a clean bridge. But the problem is I need the bevel on the bottom because you want the... You can't do um, large on top of small. You have to do small on top of large. So the bevel makes the one edge smaller, and you want that. So I basically made the model solid. You can do this in the slicer. You can tell it to, you know, seal the model, make the model whole. And then you can tell it to put top layers instead of bottom layers. So zero bottom, three top. Well, I made the model solid in Tinkercad. So if people don't know how to or if their slicer can't do that, they don't have to worry about it. It's now a solid model with no cavity. And you create the cavity by simply telling it no bottom layers and no infill. Problem solved. Now, the other problem was I still had an issue with when it would print these inside curves wouldn't attach properly so here and here wouldn't attach to the model properly um, they would miss and what happens when a curve misses it forms a straight line that's why you have things like this okay that's why you have this here and this here all right it's basically forming a straight line boy that is so hard to see on the camera it's forming a straight line between these two points where it attached and that's why you have that straight line there instead of the curve. Well, there's a, anytime you have a uh, direction change where the print head has to momentarily stop and change direction, it attaches, which is why it has no problem attaching out here, which is why it has no problem attaching here, which is why it has no problem attaching on these surfaces and attaching on these curves. 
because that's where it momentarily stops. The filament drops down, touches the other layer of filament, and holds in place. Why is this a problem to begin with? Well, in order to print a vertical stack, you have to have an air gap. You're basically doing something you're never supposed to do in 3D printing. You're printing in midair with nothing below it, at least nothing directly below it. Normally, you print one layer directly on top of another layer, and the two layers are touching. Okay? So you're printing one layer on top of another, and the two layers are touching. Well, the problem is, if you do that, the parts are going to fuse, and you'll end up with this, and that's never coming apart, even with a hacksaw. <laughs> um, in order to get these parts to actually separate, you have to make the connection between the two parts tenuous. You, have to, you need it to be close enough to touch, to hold on, but not close enough to fuse, so they can't come apart. And you do that with an air gap. So let me show you that in the slicer one moment. So here we are inside the slicer. And you can see I have my stack. This took um, a very long time to create. Because in order for the process I use to work, I need to create 35 copies, space those 35 copies out. And I also need to create 35 processes. One process for each and every object because I need that first layer to be slower so that the filament has a chance to drop through the air gap and attach to but not fuse to the other layer. So I also want it to be fast so that it doesn't take three days to print 35 of these. I got this down to the point where I could print 35 of these in 18 hours. So each of my six printers can make 35 of these per day with time to spare. And I can process 210 of these a day using just six printers. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm blown away it works. So here's what I'm doing. In the slicer, you can see this. There's an actual gap. See the gaps? There's an actual gap in between each model. Now you're getting away with this because of the way 3D printing works. With gravity being involved. So when it prints... The, the first layer of this piece through the air gap on this piece the filament is still warm enough by the time it crosses that air gap to drop down on top of the first piece and attach if you make the gap too close your parts will fuse if you print too hot or too slow the parts will fuse if you print too far you begin to separate and not work correctly okay um, or if you print those were the same distance but wrong settings okay and wrong geometry so what I did was I went into Tinkercad. Let me show you that. So here's how I did this. What I have here are little imperfections that I added to the model. Little cutouts and notches I put in the model. So when it tries to draw from this point here to this point here, if at any point it separates, it's going to draw a straight line from here to here where the layer won't attach. And then it's going to take many, many layers for that to eventually work its way back and attach. So I added hard points where the printer has to make a 90 degree turn, where it has to momentarily stop and go bup, 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 like that. And that is what these little notches are that I put in the print right here. See? Got a little notch right there. And then I have another one here and another one here. And I have one here at the corner. And I have little notches in the visor. This is like where it really loves to detach. And I have one little notch back here. It very rarely detaches back here, but it helps a little bit. Okay. Now, those notches cause that slight pause where the printer, instead of doing one fluid zoop, like this, it goes zoop, dip, dip, zoop, dip, dip, zoop, dip, dip, and it pauses. And each time it pauses, that's where the filament will have time to drop down and touch the other layer and hold fast so that you don't get that disconnected strand. And in this case, even if you do get a disconnected strand, the strand is still within the plastic boundary of the model because of how close I have those together. My first model, I had too many of those, and the attachment was too strong, and it was too difficult to get these layers apart you know, by hand. You couldn't really pull them apart like that. Um, so I've reduced the number of them and put them in key places. Um, this also means you can go faster. <laughs> Because now I just need that first layer. I actually need the first two layers to be slow. But that's harder to do. I can do it. The slicer will do it. But it's a pain in the ass. Because I have to create a multiple process scenario for every single one. That's 
35 multi-process splits I have to create. And yeah, no thanks. <laughs> it's good enough as it is. I'm just going to leave it alone. <laughs> um, so how did I do that? I did that in Tinkercad. All I did here was to put these little cuts. Each of these here is a cut. And it's only cutting into the model 0 0.4 millimeters. So two layers. So that's all you need. You need those two layers, and then everything else can build on top of that. So I did it on the bevel side so that you have the smaller on top of larger, which is higher chance of success. So in this case, the bevel actually helps. And I just cut a little notch into the model. And when I'm done with that, I merge them together. But I don't merge them with the ears. And you end up with your cuts in your model. So now I have that 0 0.4 millimeter set of cuts throughout that first layers of the model. And the ears were another problem I ran into with this print, where the ears kept detaching. And you rotate it 180, and you export these two models, and you bring them into Tinker, into Simplify 3D or whatever slicer you're using. Okay. So I had a problem with these ears detaching. So these would warp up off the bed and detach. Um, if you're using like a PC type surface, you can grab a little bit of gloop and just paint over that first layer and that'll usually hold it down. But that doesn't work on the glass because the gloop doesn't stick to the glass the same way. It doesn't, doesn't join the two parts, the plastic to the glass. So the ears work perfectly. All six printers, no separations whatsoever. Now, in the slicer, this is where it gets fun, okay? So let me, um, this is saved, so I can just delete all this and start over again and show you what I did. So you start off with one, and then you also start off with these ears. Now, Tinkercad preserves ears if you do it properly, so as long as you don't move the parts, the relative position of the parts is retained. So if I select both of these parts, and you do this before you start your stacking, and I go to edit, and I go to align selected model origins. There you go. So now the ear is correctly aligned with the, um, the part. And basically I'm creating a custom brim. I could just enable brim in the slicer, but that's going to add well over an hour to your total print time. Well, not an hour. Uh, probably about 20 or 30 minutes to your print time for it to create the brim because that first layer has to be really slow. This part doesn't have a problem separating. It's just this part down here. I don't, this, these, these don't separate, just this separates. And um, so adding that little custom brim there, what I call ears, you can do this in a lot of models, by the way. If you create yourself a little 20 millimeter disc that's 0.2 millimeters tall, and you can rescale this in the slicer. So if you're printing at 0.4 millimeter layers, you just tell the slicer to make it 0.4 millimeters thick. You can do basic editing like that in the slicer. So if I click on the ears here, you can see it's 0.2. Well, if I take off this uniform scaling, I can tell it to make it 0 0.24, so if I'm going to use 0 0.24 layers, which you don't want to do, but we'll get to that in a moment. But you can do basic modifications. You can scale these parts like that. And this is great for if you have a problem with parts lifting. Just drop a couple of discs at the key points where the part tends to lift, and you have custom brims without having to do a brim over the entire model. So now how do you get your stack? I do believe there is a utility that will actually do this now. You can actually get a utility that will take a file and create an STL stack for you. I'm going to have to experiment with that. I've been doing it manually. So what I do is I select my part, and I do Control C, and then Control V, 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 I will then go and rename these just to make it easier. You saw before I had them renamed. So now you have all these parts. They're going off into Never Never Land. How do you fix that? Well, that's easy. You select them all. Don't select your ears. You don't want to move them. And this is my purge line. That's something different. And you go to Edit, and you go to Align Selected Model Origins. Boom. Now I have 35 models sitting on top of each other. See? You see the little parts sticking out here and there? I have 35 models sitting on top of each other. If I double-click a model, I bring up my settings here. Now I go to model 2. Now this model is exactly 5 millimeters tall. That's important because that's um, the reason I'm printing at 0.2 millimeter layer height is because it's evenly divisible into 5 millimeters. 
which means this model at 0 0.2 millimeters has an exact number of layers that exactly equals its height. That's important so that you don't start eating into your air gap. Your air gap needs to be reliable. If your model is 5.1 millimeters tall, uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to use the same number of layers. It it's, depends on the slicer. It could do weird things. You, you really want the model to be evenly divisible by your layer height. I chose an air gap of 0 0.4 millimeters, two layers. I don't think the two. I don't think the number of layers matters. I think the 0 0.4 millimeters matters. I'm also experimenting with 0 0.5 millimeters on printers that do not separate so easily. The 0 0.5 millimeters is working in combination with all my little notches that I create to make this more reliable. So you go to your second model and you tell it 5.4 millimeters, and there you go. Now your second model is sitting. 0.4 millimeters above your first model. Okay. Now there is. Now it doesn't really make it easier. Okay, go to number three. Now you have to do 5.4 plus 5.4, 10.8. Then you go to number four, add 5.4 to that, 11.2 in five, it's 15.6. Um, I'm sorry, 16.2. All right. And then 21.6. You just keep doing that until you get all the way to the top. <laughs> yeah, it's a pain in the ass. I sat here with a calculator and did 5.4 plus, put the number in. 5.4 plus, put the number in. 5.4 plus, put the number in. Because your brain starts to get weird with those numbers as you get higher and higher and higher. Um, now to change the gap, it's a pain in the butt. I got to go to this one. I want to add 0.1 to it. Well, that's easy. 5.5. There you go. I added 0.1. But now I have to add 2. So this has to go not 0.1 because I have to go 0.1 to get back to the same gap I had with the first one because I raised the first one 0.1 and then another 0.1 to get the increase in gap. So now it's 11. You have to do that all the way up. Yeah, it's a pain. <laughs> so um, look into that utility. I'll, if I find that utility, I'll create a link down below. Um, now you have to worry about flow rate, speed. So in my settings here, I have my speed set to 60 millimeters per second. It's pretty fast. It works nice. But I have my first layer set for 10% speed. You gotta slow down because first of all, you're printing at a relatively low temperature. You want to print as cool as you can. I'm printing at 200 C. And um, here, where's that? Temperature, 200 C. Or 205. Depends on the air gap. At the 0.3, I was able to raise the temperature a little bit, which helps. Because sometimes if you go too low in temperature, the parts themselves will come apart instead of the parts separating. Because uh, higher temperature, better layer bond. Um, so you want your extrusion to be about 105, 105. You're going to increase your extrusion for that first layer. Because you need to make sure you have enough mass coming out of there that it actually drops down and touches the other part. You don't want the fuse, but it does have to touch it or it's not going to print right. Does that one have a layer I can show you? No. I'm hoping I can show you the, the model printing on top of the model. I don't think I have any examples. I do. Here we go. So let me switch back to this view. And you can actually see there's a little piece of it right there. Still stuck to it. Come on. See? That's a little piece of the first layer of the second model printing on top of this model. Basically, this becomes the print bed for the next print. You can see a little more over here. Not really, you can't see it. But you can see it clearly there. So that's a piece of the first layer of the second model printing on top of the first model. And that's what you want. Don't use silks, because silks contract and they're not going to work well. When you air print silk, if you want to see what I'm talking about, push some silk through your extruder and see what happens. If you push PLA through, you get a long skinny strand. Like, you know, you get something like, you get something like that, okay? You push silk through, and it's going to come out as a strand, and then go, and get fat. Because <laughs> the elastomers contract. And that is a bad thing when it comes to printing on layers. Plus, your part will delaminate, and you don't want that. Um, that's basically it. That's what I did. Then on the printer itself, you experiment with speed and temperature. Okay. If you're sticking, try to increase the speed a little bit. 
that'll give it um the because you'll get a slightly less heat as you increase speed because you're increasing your volumetric flow through the nozzle and it'll decrease the chance of that nozzle attaching oh also because i'm over extruding all these to make it stronger i'm extruding at 1.6 extrusion multiplier i then tell my infill to extrude at 85 percent because otherwise your infill is going to be these super thick layers and you don't want that because then it's going to bulge out and attach to the other one above it okay you get sloppy infill so amp up your extrusion multiplier but lower your infill extrusion width to compensate for that over extrusion for the perimeters to make them nice and strong um, that's basically it by slowing down i am increasing the temperature and i'm giving gravity more time to allow that layer to attach to the layer below it and here's another important trick you got to make sure you normally for your first layer you have the cooling fan off and you want that but you don't want that on your vertical layers you want the cooling fan going full blast because you have to cool that extrusion coming out of the nozzle as much as possible before it touches the layer below it otherwise it'll fuse to it instead of sticking to it that's what happened here <laughs> when I created these 35 processes to process the individual pieces here that you see I forgot to um, to turn off the function here for cooling where first layer was zero and third layer was a hundred I had to make first layer a hundred so the fan never turned off because if the fan turns off you end up with a giant block and I mean a giant block <laughs> this is never coming apart <laughs> oops <laughs> so just turn the cooling fan back on fix that okay so I had to create a group so that I can turn the cooling fan off for everything except the first one because obviously the first one you want the cooling fan off for the first two layers to make sure you get bed adhesion now another trick to help with making this more efficient to make this more cost effective because electricity is eventually going to become a problem if you start running a lot of machines 24 7 to power these things I mean my electric bill with everything turned on my printers consume about a hundred bucks worth of electricity a month now that's running a lot of printer of course if you're running one printer it's not going to be nowhere near as bad but let's say your printer consumes I don't know 150 watts on average okay 150 watts times 24 times 30 is 108,000 watts now big mistake I made in my last video divide by 1,000 to convert to kilowatts <laughs> I forgot to do that um, so convert to kilowatts times it by your electric rate my electricity here is very expensive 18 cents a kilowatt so that is basically 20 bucks per printer I'm running on average five or six printers sometimes seven or eight printers so I'm spending between 100 and 120 bucks a month on electricity if you're running just one printer it's 20 bucks even at full tilt on a big printer don't worry about it it's not that huge a deal and your electricity is probably cheaper than mine anyway unless you live in California <laughs> Uh, if you live up northeast, you're, it's going to be cheaper for you. In Pennsylvania, I was paying $0.08 cents a kilowatt, so this would have been $10. Um, but it is a factor. So one of the things that I do, this is another power of multiple processes, is that I told it, okay, heat bed on, heat bed on, heat bed on, and then turn the heat bed off for the rest. Well, I just reduced my power consumption from 150 watts to 40 watts. <laughs> That's a big difference, especially when you're doing a big printer. This printer is not going to consume 150 watts on average, but my Chiron, probably 200 watts on average. <laughs> so it, it adds up fast. Um, but that only works if you are using a print surface where you could turn off the heat without consequence. And that's also where these ears come in handy to make sure it stays attached. If you're printing on glass, silicon dioxide, ultra base, or PEI or PEX, you can't turn off the heat. Most, especially with a thin model like this, it's just going to pop off as soon as it cools down. Sorry, <laughs> it's morning here. Um, it's just going to pop off as soon as it cools down, so you can't do that. But there you go. Those are the little different tips and tricks that I came up with to allow you to vertical print or create the stack <laughs> to make a whole bunch of these models. Why? What's the point? Well, now the point is I can tell this printer to go as you can see right here I'm not doing anything to it I can just tell this printer to run 
and it will just keep doing this for 20 hours. I don't have to keep going back to this printer, clear the bed, prep it for another print, wait for it to heat up again, do all that crap. I, in the morning, I take these prints off, I hit go, and it just goes all day and all night until it's done. And the next day I go and clear all the printers. I only have to do it once a day now. This is now a largely automated factory, and that makes a huge difference in how long it takes to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> and if you get it right, so that you can manually separate these parts without having to fight them too much, so that you can pull them apart by hand without having to use tools, because trust me, the tools are going to mess you up. You will screw up. You will slip. I mean, even when using, even these things closed are sharp enough to put nice, you know, gouging holes in my fingers and hands. <laughs> I got sores all over me from these damn tools. So now, once I get them tuned right, I don't have to use tools. So, you don't have to do all this work. Uh, I'm, I'm spending hours and hours and hours. I got 200 hours, at least, at least 200 hours in Slicer and Tinkercad, just tweaking the crap out of this stuff to make this stuff work. Most of it in the Slicer. I did the work for you. Down below is a Thingiverse file. If you want to make this particular kind of mask or face shield, um, if you want to send them off to Tim for him to take care of making the, the flexies and the elastic and whatnot, um, I've made it for you so you can play with it. I have it for 200 by 200. I have it for 200 by 180 for those kind of printers because I found out I on my Wii do I can't print them this way. I have to print them this way. I kept wondering why I kept taking these off, and that's because it was outside the build volume. <laughs> Three millimeters outside the build volume. Um, and I also have it for deltas. Heat on, heat off. Um, this way you can play with it. I have the factory files there. I have the STL files there. So if you want to play around with it and mess with it, have at it. Have fun. It's a pretty neat process. It's a very, very niche process. It only works for very specific prints in very specific shapes under very specific conditions. But if the model you're trying to print does fit those conditions, it's pretty damn cool. It, it literally turns your 3D printer into an automated factory. You could just tell it to go and come back a day later, and there's a stack of 35 of them sitting there waiting for you to pull apart and go on to the next ones. And if you do it right, they come apart with just your fingers. You don't need any tools. These are done. These are ready to go. I don't have to do anything to them. Put them in a box, ship them out. That's it. If you have any questions, ask down below. I will see you guys later. You have a great day.